Come join us as we dive deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today, interviewing top leaders from around the world and sharing true cybercrime stories to raise awareness. But first, a huge thank you to all of our executive co-producers who subscribed to our Prime membership and fueled our growth. So please help us keep this going by subscribing for free to our YouTube channel and downloading our episodes on Apple or Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and now, the show. Hey, welcome everybody to Cybercrime Junkies. I'm your host, David Morrow, and today's episode is going to be Blind Spot, our interview with Huxley. Barbie. Uh, Huxley, thank you so much for joining, man. I really, really appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you for having me, David. Thank yeah. you. And for those that may not be familiar with, with Huxley, um, he's a CISSP, CISM, he's organized B-Sides in New York City, highly sought after security expert, public speaker, and security evangelist at Run Zero. Um, previously worked at Datadog, where he formulated their cloud security platform. And then earlier when you were at Cisco, uh, headed up a team that automated SecOps and IR playbooks. So vast experience. Uh, can't wait to uh, dive into it. Um, you know, one of the first questions I always want to know when I uh, meet somebody at your level that's so entrenched in the security community is kind of what was there an event or what drove you to steer you toward security? when you were growing up or what, what, like how, how did it, how did, what, what inspired you to, to begin in it? Oh, it, it's, <laughs> there's nothing so noble or, or anything like that. I just, you know, my friends and I, we needed dial up access for cheap. Yeah. So this is, this is before AOL had those, those free internet CDs. Yeah. So you had to pay for your, your modem access uh, with a local ISP and, you know, being, Poor high school students. We we found a way. That so you you began the the interest in hacking out of necessity or or desire in a, in a, in a sense. Necessity in the mind of a high schooler. Right. You know? Yeah, and that's where some of the best stories are. <laughs> yeah. I'm like nobody was going hungry. Nobody was like homeless. But right. We, in our minds, this is a, this is what we needed. So. Yeah. And, and in some of your uh, uh, public speaking and presentations, uh, you also are known by the name Void. Like, tell us, tell us about that and what the story is behind it. Yeah. That. Okay. So, yeah. Sometimes you might see like Void Star in front of my name. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's, um, it's kind of a commentary because it's somewhat paradoxical, but like Void Star, it's like a, it's a, it's a it's C syntax, C programming syntax. Mm -hmm. Just meaning a pointer, like my name is just a pointer to to who I, who I really am, and, and things like this. That's hilarious. Yeah. And uh, is that is that a username that you used? At times, you you may find me in in certain venues, uh, certain platforms as as Void Star. But yeah, so I'd, rather than replacing my my actual name with a handle, like the handle is the name itself, and right, there's a yeah bit of a Excellent. pointer to it. anyway <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's the syntax is what it yeah, is yeah exactly so um so tim tell me about your uh your your early years kind of just what what kind of uh you know how did you did, did you begin back in the day um focused in security or was it like a migration from network management and standard kind of it into the mm -hmm. into the security specialty yeah, you know, I would say security was always there in some form, uh, even even before the term cybersecurity was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but oftentimes it was just sort of like an undercurrent to the other things that we're doing. I spent a lot of time learning uh, networking, IT networking, mm -hmm. which of course then feeds back into security. And I spent uh, quite a long time working as a software engineer. And... Uh, that of course uh, fed into security as well. Like there was a sure. time when application security was not even a thing, right. uh, but 
it's of, of course blown up completely and so having a software engineering background security uh, as well so security's always been there it's just more of a an undercurrent and i would say maybe you know 15 years ago is is when like i i went back to security and fully embracing it as like yeah this this is this is the life's work at this point yeah so did you um when when i look back at your time at cisco um walk us through kind of like automating the ir playbooks like mm -hmm. what 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 did that look like tell tell us tell us a, a little bit about that yeah you know funny enough early on i had i had always uh, pushed for push for the service towards larger enterprises, but learn fairly quickly that many of these larger enterprises, they already have their own security engineers on, on staff, folks who can mm -hmm. code in Python and, and things like this, where they would either write the code on their own or they would use some sort of store platform and then layer on top of that to get the, the playbooks that they need or playbook automation that they need. But as it turned out, um, it's really the smaller companies that could really benefit from that, that type of service where you're automating sick ops and, and, and some response playbook, playbooks for them simply because they just don't have the people. Right? Right. That, that cybersecurity talent shortage affects smaller companies and companies that are not in dense urban centers far more. And I'm sure, you know, with all the remote work that's happened with the pandemic, it's, it's eased up a bit. But that that phenomenon is still there. It is still these smaller companies or companies that are not in the urban centers that just don't have people. And they just don't have that that either the capability or the bandwidth to go and create that automation for their IR playbooks or security operations or or maintain them over time. Right. Right. Maintain them. Yeah. Correct. And that, and that, that's really the key, right? So when we're talking about IR playbooks and mm -hmm. can you just explain, let's take a 30,000 foot view. Can you explain for the listeners what we're talking about? It's, yeah. it's in the event of a breach, right? What is the incident response? Who's going to do what, who communicates with what, who remediates what? Walk right. us so through th that. This, so this happens even before you've declared that there was a breach. Right? Mm -hmm. There was exactly. some signal that came up, maybe an alert or maybe even a report by a user that says, oh, hey, you know, there's something here and right. please look into that. And oftentimes there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that, that investigation, the research part of it to understand whether or not this is truly an incident in the first place. So, right. uh, for example, let's say you have an alert based on multiple denies on the firewall, right? So something on your land is, is going the out, firewall, right? It's, it's trying to get out and it's getting blocked by the firewall and it's happening in rapid succession, right? Probably not a human being doing that if it's, if it's that quick, right? Right. Potentially something that's phoning home for whatever reason, right? And so what would you do manually? Well, first you, you have to go look at those firewall logs. Right. Then you want to go see, hey, you know, what is this what is this device um, looking like in terms of the EDR? Have any new files shown up on this? Right? What is the, the process that's trying to make the connection out? Right. And if this is a recently downloaded file, let me go check the, 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 the web proxy logs to see where it came from. Or did it come? Was it downloaded via email? In which case, if it was downloaded via email, was that email sent to anybody else in the company? Did they also download it? Right. And do, do I need to go look at that as well? So there's a lot of manual effort here of looking at all these different tools to get full context of what something is. Is it truly an incident or, or, or is it not? And if it is truly an incident, you know, what is the blast radius of it? And then finally, if I need to, you know, what is the remediation that uh, I might take here? Some of this you can automate with a, a SOAR platform. But at the end of the day, somebody has to do that automation, right? Right. And Some, somebody has to configure it, install it, and then design it that'll fit this, this specific organization. Right. And, and the thing is, playbooks, they 
have to evolve with the times, right? Mm -hmm. The threat landscape changes, the, 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 the attack vectors change, your organization's attack surface changes as well. And so uh, sometimes you'll find that a playbook that worked really well no longer works well after a certain period yeah. of time. It's, it's starting to generate a lot of false positives, creating more trouble than it's worth. And so that has to be retired. In other cases, you, f you find that a playbook is uh, working so well that it truly needs no manual intervention whatsoever. That's what we consider a high fidelity playbook, right? And so that, that just runs like basically as a, as, a, as a background process all the time. But somebody has to manage this, right? It doesn't just automatically maintain itself. Somebody has to be reviewing the playbooks. It, does it still work? Does it be updated? Does this, does this actually uh, protect my organization's attack surface as it is today? Or, or does it not? Yeah, and that's really where we get into the struggle that SMBs and small and mid-sized businesses have, right? Because they don't have the personnel. Um, even if they have the funds to pay the personnel, it's a struggle to find the personnel that uh, that are available and capable of doing it. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And the thing is, another coming at this from another angle, like the situation's gotten worse for SMBs mm -hmm. because um, last I checked, like the average ransomware was like $30,000 or something like that. So this means that some bad actor from somewhere else, they have a much wider pool of targets to go after, right? Because if, right. if average ransomware was $2 million, there's only a handful of companies that can really go after, right? I'm not going to go and attack right. a company that can't pay the ransom that I'm asking for, right? Right. Right. So if average ransomware were $2 million, it's just basically large enterprises that I'm going to attack. But if it's $30,000, now all of a sudden that just brings that threshold down. And now there are a lot of medium-sized companies that I can go after and, and, and attempt to ransom, right? So because that, that sort of um, threshold has come down, it's made SMBs far more susceptible than, than in the past that they smbs can no longer just sort of fly under the radar because oh we're not very big who's going to attack us like yeah who's going to come and hit us and demand what they did in these in the ones that we see in the news right right but it but it, but yeah. it happens all the time it happens all the time and when they're asking for 20 30k like you are a target now right mm -hmm. that's still, and, I mean, and that's not the total cost that the smbs has because they've got the downtime they've got the downtime in product in production they might have insurance claims all this other aspect yeah there's some statistic that i saw recently you know uh, numerous small and medium-sized businesses go, go 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 bankrupt six months after a cyber attack right i mean th these are real material ramifications uh yep. for for being attacked and and like basically everybody's vulnerable like not not to be so much fear uncertainty and doubt but like th that is a reality no but i also see I, I also think that there's there's some aspect you know we talk about this a lot in the show that there's there's almost a cultural aspect in the in the united states we don't tend to value our personal private data and our privacy like they do in other countries Right. Mm -hmm. And we're curating our lives on social media and we're doing all these things. And and we don't in in you see that in the small business, mid-sized business space too, right? They they don't necessarily take some of the steps that they could, um, and 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 then they wind up closing shop or having terrible years one after another that eventually leads to reduction in growth and other things, even if they don't close. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a it's a hard problem to solve, right? Because you go into business mm -hmm. because you're trying to sell a product. Yeah, you're trying to build service. something, right? You're not you're not here to be a cybersecurity expert, right? right? And yet, you need to be a little bit of that, or leverage somebody who can help you with that, in order to make yeah, sure. Yeah, because that it's about it's continues. about the brand protection. It's about the reputation protection right the small businesses are in business because their customers trust them and right. when a breach happens it it goes to the heart of the credibility yeah yeah so and why do you think that is like from from your experience and all the the b-sides and rsas you go to and all the the defcons and black hats and like why do you think 
so many security tools and systems and why do you think they i don't want to say fail because i think they do the job that they said they're going to do sure. but the but the organizations don't implement everything correctly necessarily or have enough layers or something yes why do you think like, that is like why the tools fail or uh, no or like just... why why there's still so many breaches today that are in the news compared to compared to before and 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 why uh, SMBs struggle so much? Yeah, I always well, like to ask that because I don't. I, no one really has the answer. I'm just curious. I'm. I'm, I'm just. I, I think those are. There's, there's two two different things to unpack here. Like, like why are there still breaches just in general, right? And there there are many many reasons for that, right? Yeah, like of course. The 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 wrong tools for the job, uh, and incorrect use of those tools, mm -hmm. or uh, lack of backing from like leadership, but just there's a whole slew of reasons why why security still is an unsolved problem for businesses large and small. I think for SMBs more specifically though is a lot of innovation in cybersecurity is geared towards larger enterprises. Mm -hmm. Like that's because that's that's where the money is, right? Right. Um you know, I I don't Obviously, there needs to be more done for SMBs, but you know, with the current landscape, numerous, numerous cybersecurity startups are looking towards larger businesses to to fuel their continued growth. There, sure. there are smaller there there are vendors that that cater to the smaller businesses. Of course, they exist, mm -hmm. but you don't hear about them uh, quite as much. They don't. They're right. not the ones that have the booths at uh, RSA and Black Hat or, yeah. or anything like that. And they're not the types who can afford to ha hire security researchers to be on staff, right? right? Yep. They, they need to benefit from that research, but they can't afford to, to handle that, um, to support that on their own. And so there's this imbalance yeah, so as of innovation going towards larger enterprises, but not, not small businesses. Yeah. So as we're, as we're talking about that, what role, like, how does information sharing play a role like how does some of the things that CISA is driving and their desire to be like we can't public service we can't PSA our way out of these uh, right scenarios, yeah, I saw that right? recently. yeah yeah, yeah. Like, um, how does that play into it like you know are there ISACs that SMBs can get involved in are there like what what, what are business owners who want like who don't have unlimited funds and and right. don't necessarily understand all the complexities, but they want to stay secure. Like, how do they, whether they're using an MSSP or whatever, like how do, how do they share information or get information from some of these enterprise organizations that are, you know, evolving a little quicker up the maturity scale? I, I definitely see the local MSSPs as um, one of the ways to sort of bridge that gap, right? The local MSSPs, have the the knowledge and the know-how and the capabilities to to help uh, these small medium-sized businesses and mm -hmm. they tend to have a regional focus right yep. the, the challenge is finding an mssp that you trust because there there are right. there are so many out there and uh not all mssps are are created equal right yeah and just finding the one that you can trust that you can really like count on for when things go things go bad that that's probably the challenge i would say um, yeah it's fine I, yeah right, right, i think you're spot it. on oh yeah hey everyone as you know we routinely discuss how risky it is for brands to rely just on passwords or weak old-fashioned multi-factor authentication systems it's your brand and we want you to protect it today we're excited to be sponsored by a next generation authentication platform beyond identity did you know 80% of breaches are the result of stolen credentials? Why does your organization still rely on passwords as part of your authentication process? Beyond Identity enforces continuous risk-based authentication, a fundamental tenet of a zero-trust security program. Check the link in our show notes and go to beyondidentity.com slash podcast to get a free demo. That's beyondidentity.com slash podcast to get a free demo. Beyondidentity.com slash podcast for a free demo today. 
or simply click the link in our show notes below. And now the show. Absolutely. Yeah. Because and and a lot of it is the is the promises that are made and the, you know, the absolute terms that are used and, you know, it doesn't come out of a product, right. And nothing's going to like cure it. It's all about yeah. just layers and strategy and it's an ongoing living, breathing battle basically. And, and also like, is the MSSP speaking your language? Cause right. You know, if all they're talking to you is about like, okay, so when when there's an alert, we're gonna take care of this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna quarantine this and whatever. Like, and that's just tactical. That's just features and benefits and stuff like that. That's yeah. not if I were getting to the heart of it. Owner, if I were a small business owner, I don't care. Like I don't I don't need exactly. to know. Exactly. I just like right. I wanna know that I'm protected. I wanna right. know that my employee's not gonna click on this phishing link. Like, you know, it, it, it that's that's the level where you know we talk about like meeting the customer where they are like that's the level where the mssp has to go to and not all of them are like that not all of them are, right. are like yeah it really it, to me what, what do you think about this it almost boils down to the questions that the mssp would ask like how are they getting to know that small business owner that small or mid-sized business owner like are they asking them what is your appetite for risk because it's just a, it's really just a scale, right? You can you can scale up if you invest more. You can scale up your security level, you know, more. But some have a greater appetite for risk. Some don't really. Uh, they're they're willing to to travel without without that dial all the way up. So so finding out that that risk appetite, I think, can help. And that's a tough conversation to have, right? So I, I, I oh, personally yeah. know some small, um, small business owners, and what you're talking about there is essentially the risk management matrix, understanding right. the risk appetite. Do you want to do risk transfer or risk avoidance or risk acceptance or risk mitigation? Mm -hmm. And and they, you know, the small business owner tends to not think about that. They just they just right. Am I, am I they secure? don't want to think about it. I'm secure. They don't want to think about it. Right. Right. Like you, you just took right. care of that. And now I'm secure. Like, and the, the whole idea of it is possible to eliminate all, all security risks. Like that's obviously a myth that I think at the enterprise level is, is understood like that it's a myth and nobody's going right. to argue with that. Like, that's a silly thing. You know, you should expect to be breached at some point. It's just a question of what you do about it with the, with, when the, the, in the SMB world, I feel like that is still a conversation that needs to be had. And yeah, it's viewed as binary, you... right? Yeah, it's viewed right. as binary. It's it's either like I'm either you're my guy, I'm secure or not, right? Yeah, and it's like it's not like that. Yeah, so that conversation still needs to be had in a way that you don't lose credibility as as mm -hmm. the security consultant, right? It's a it's a tough yeah. thing to do. So, you know, we talk about like what do we do to improve SMB security at large? I mean, some of it, a lot of it, <laughs> is is still like just general education uh, about mm -hmm. cybersecurity coupled with, you know, having tools or services that can cater to organizations at that price point. And yeah. it's a, a very tough problem to solve and it's going to be, you know, decades before it's, it gets better. Yeah. I feel like, All right, maybe I'm Absolutely. being too pessimistic, but <laughs> it feels like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I see it every day. So uh, what do you, what do you think about while we're still on this topic, the effect that cybersecurity insurance and that industry and all the changes that have happened, how is that driving things? I mean, it seems like, especially in the SMB space, it's getting them at least to do some basic hygiene. You know, if you want a policy, you can, you have to do MFA, you have to do EDR, you've got to do some, some of these basic things that at the enterprise yeah. level they, they've been doing for years. Yeah. Probably, probably the most interesting that's happened recently is, is how much, cybersecurity insurance premiums have gone up right? mm -hmm. and insurance is a risk transfer treatment yeah. it's of, it's of not going to keep it doesn't do anything for the reputation or the lost customers right but it's it was right? transferred now if the cost for risk transfer goes up it stands to reason that people would start switching to risk mitigation or or risk acceptance or risk even risk avoidance, uh, yeah, or even risk avoidance. Absolutely. Um, so 
you know, SMBs don't necessarily have the money to pay the higher premiums. So what do they do instead? Right? They could they go invest they go, in other they go services. Naked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If if they're not willing to then reallocate money towards towards new new tools and services, then then it's like yeah, it's it's risk 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 acceptance at that point. It's just like yeah, mm -hmm. if it happens, it happens. I'll just deal with it. Uh, for the ones that can still afford those premiums, though, you're, you're right. Like right? there's there's things that you um, loss control measures from the insurer that you would implement to try and lower your premiums. Um, exactly, exactly what percentage of SMBs go towards risk acceptance versus continuing to use risk transfer but implementing measures to lower their premiums? I don't know yet. I, I think I think time will tell uh, exactly. Um, time will tell as to whether or not, you know, or what percentage of SMBs go one way versus the other way due to the increased cost of, of insurance premiums. Oh. You know, one, one thing I'm always shocked by is the number of SMB owners, leadership, uh, directors at those levels that don't do like tabletop exercises. They don't do those annual fire drills. Do you yeah. guys see that too? I mean, you've done so much work on asset discovery and the importance of true asset discovery. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, but, but like, I just want to talk about tabletop exercises, and it's really a a a surprise to me when I meet so many business owners that don't that mm -hmm. don't embrace that and don't take the time to do those. Yeah, you know, and, and what for, are you saying? Forget the whole like idea of like you know person in a hoodie like breaching mm -hmm. your network and things like that like you should be doing tabletop exercises for what if there's a hurricane what right. if there's earthquake kids right? do it in school when for fire drills they've been doing them right. for decades right you and know. why is that because otherwise on the day of the fire kids could be hurt and scatter and panic and go the wrong way and you know a lot more damage and yet they'll create you know, we've got a disaster recovery plan. We've got a incident response plan, but it sits over on the shelf. And then you like, to me, I'm always, it blows my mind because they're going to wait until the files are turning white on their desktop to, to pull it out, dust it off and look and be like, Oh, hey, hey, Carl's supposed to do this. Oh, by the way, he's no longer here. What are we supposed to do? Right? Like, yeah, yeah you know, yeah, I, yeah. it's crazy. So I was at a previous company where uh, we had an incident response retainer. And mm -hmm. there's like a menu of services. You know, one of them was emergency breach response. So, you know, if you get popped, you know, we, we parachute somebody in figuratively, parachute somebody in to like figure out what happened. But there are all these other services on that menu and tabletop exercises was, was on there, but yeah. customers rarely opted to, mm -hmm. you know, invoke that particular, particular service in their subscription. It's, it's, it's mind boggling because like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're you're getting a group of folks together, spending like a few hours, maybe, you know, just going through this. Yeah, once things. a year, even like once a yeah. year for a few hours. That's it. it. Like so, like you know, in the short term, I think, oh, you know, all this cost of having basically a, a big meeting, but the things that you uncover as part of that mm -hmm. is is actually um, very very useful and very actionable, right? And I'm gonna take this mm -hmm. back to like uh, incident response playbooks. Mm -hmm. So back when I was consulting for this, one of the first things that we did was we have an in-person meeting with the security team, right? To, mostly SOC engineers. And I would lead a discussion dis talking about, hey, what are the things that you're doing right now manually that are taking up a lot of your time? And we would just basically like draw it out and things like this. Frequently, the CISO or the deputy CISO was sitting on that meeting and almost a hundred percent of the time, the CISO or the deputy CISO would find out about inefficiencies in that SOC team. Right. Cause there's some, there's some, almost there's every some, time. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some inefficiencies that, that we weren't going to solve with technology. It could have right. been like, Oh wait, every time you do this, you got to talk to Joe in that department. Exactly. Oh, oh, I'm going to talk to Joe's boss. We'll take care of that. Right. Right? They're, they're, people things that could be done to, to make security better. But the thing is, it wasn't until we all got into a room and I was leading this discussion about what they were doing, right? Step by step that the leader 
found out about what the problems were. And it's almost like a living racy document, right? Like, mm -hmm. like who's responsible, who needs to be consulted, who needs to, you know, uh, uh, be accountable for it, who needs just to be aware of it for, for this task. Right. And then what happens next? Well, then this happens. Okay. Who does what then? And then you're just kind of like plugging those roles in. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 either the race is stale or never existed. And, and you're just learning about the race. <laughs> yeah. In that, in that meeting. And the same thing with tabletop exercises, you, the thing, things come out, things come out. Yeah. yeah. That's so, that's ab absolutely true. Um, what, you know, what are you what are your thoughts and this is not in your field of specialty i'm just asking you personally like what are you where do you think it's going in terms of like some mandatory regulation for certain industries i mean we've seen it you know we know there's there's hipaa there's cmmc like what do you think is coming because the you've got that that new u.s cyber strategy you've got CISA talking about like s bombs with with product development and what do you think is going to happen to in you know why wider spread in the industry is there going to be you know i mean the, to me there needs to be some information sharing but then people don't they, there needs to be a safe harbor for that meaning they need to be able to share information without getting sued or find or other things right but then you know uh, how are they how do they implement that like what 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 do, what do you think is coming well certainly i think on the federal side there's going to be more and more regulations right cisa mm -hmm. cisa recently released bod 2301 which requires mm -hmm. asset discovery and, and vulnerability enumeration they also released bod 2302 which while it does not 100% require a zero trust architecture, it's right. It basically saying that, right, like you know, just beneath the surface there, right? Um, right. So they they, I, they were implying it. You could read the tea leaves there. Right, yeah, I mean, I mean, they explicitly explicitly say zero trust. They just didn't require you to absolutely have it right now. But mm -hmm. like it was is either one of two options: turn it off. Or have a zero, zero trust solution to the problem of mm -hmm. um, insecure configurations. So, if, if you have insecure configurations uh, exposed to the internet, for example, like uh, if you're running RDP on a device that has a pu public IP address uh, accessible over the internet, either you turn that off or you implement a zero trust architecture such that the authentication to that device is happening uh, out of band, right? Right. So. They didn't say you have to have zero trust, but basically it's like sort of pushing. It. Oh, and by the way, uh, CISA is going to be scanning your external attack surface, and you're going to have 14 days to remediate. So, I mean, it's right. basically saying that that's where the way it's going. And BOD 2301 says you have to have asset inventory that's up to date, and you need to be able to enumerate vulnerabilities on that asset inventory as well. And, you know, CISA could come in and just demand that you produce a report and you have to re return it within like three days or something like that. So federal side, lots of new regulations like that. Certain industries will continue to have the regulations that, that they do, like PCI, if you take credit cards, HIPAA, mm -hmm. if you're in healthcare. And, you know, I had always thought, going back to insurance here, I, I had always thought that cybersecurity insurance could be that sort of private sector driver yeah, that. kind of like a bit auto insurance, right? Like back in the day, you weren't right. even required to have auto insurance. People can't even imagine that. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, when I was a kid, he didn't even have to have it. Like, you yeah. know, and, and, and so, and, and by having it, it changed everything, yep. right? You saw yep. the DUI laws change. You saw all the stuff change because then insurance companies were liable and had to pay for that stuff. And all, all of a sudden things started to, started to change. And I'm, I'm just so curious I'm sure it's it's just so complex. That's why it just hasn't happened yet. But at some point, we've got to be seeing something come down. I, I, I would think either, I mean, the, f the federal government can do it at certain levels, but they're not involved in all private industry, especially right, at the exactly. SMB level, right? But insurances. Yes. So requiring everybody to have insurance, and I'm sure that like, 
there'll be like cut rate versions, like the general version of <laughs> cyber insurance. Right. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have that someday. We, but, we've, we've certainly come a long way. Like 10 yeah. years ago, I was told there, there are no actual actuarial tables for mm -hmm. cybersecurity insurance. And now, now you hear about cybersecurity insurance all the time. Right. Uh, at some point it's going to become ubiquitous. Like, car insurance or, or yep. homeowners or, insurance and yeah or like or just cgl insurance you know like directors right. and officers liability there, there, there's going to be some element of that yeah but i don't think it's going to be in the next five years oh like, really i mean yeah it doesn't I, I, I seem like it, it not that fast it, no it doesn't seem like it's like there's a big impetus yeah and especially with the recent rate rises i, I think it's going to be even slower right yeah which not that I'm a fan of more insurance <laughs> in the world. No, but, exactly. Of course. But you know, if the outcome is, you know, the our societies is more safe mm -hmm. from a cybersecurity perspective, just at large, then you know, that is one good ramification of it. Um and certainly there are many reasons, many arguments for why a driver from the private sector could be more powerful than a driver from from the government sector. Right. Um, I think, I think, I think one day if some insurer or if, if for whatever reason, maybe regulation says, listen, CIS benchmarks, CIS controls, these are the, these are, you need to have all of these, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that would be a very interesting new reality that we would be looking oh, at. Oh yeah. Because in, especially in the SMB space, because most owners don't even know what they are. They don't know what they mean. Oh yeah. No. Right. No, I'm thinking about the small business owners that I know. Like, no, oh, yeah, there's no idea. Not, right. It's like, I mean, we're still dealing with like, my password is my dog's name. I, yeah, I mean, that's and 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 you're like, what are you doing for like a you know a a SIM solution? And they're like, what's that? Yeah, like, I, I don't understand. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I um. So a friend of mine, he's a VP of services for this large service provider that caters to smbs mm -hmm. and i remember he and i were talking he's like look man i'm just trying to get edr right on these endpoints like that that yeah that's it like the others and, and their price points are so low like mm -hmm. they're, they're not they're not looking at sims no and, um and, and and he was telling me like companies that have less than 300 or so people they they just don't have a security team so no, like, the whole idea of a sim like it's just like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Right. It's like maybe like the one IT guy that does some security on the side. Right. Exactly. Or he went to a B sides once and he's like, oh, this is cool. We need right. to do this. And he right. was able to make that internal business case and actually convince ownership. Yeah. And, you know, my friend, you know, as he's working with his customers, I mean, there have been times where he's like on the network, they did a quick look at what's going on. It's like they could already tell that there were bad actors on that network already oh yeah it's just to the to the i don't know the the finance guy or the ceo of that small company it just seems like everything's slow right exactly until they knock something offline right right like unless they knock something offline just explaining the difference between regular it and security to small business owners is yeah is, is is a challenge because they they don't under they're like oh my my local msp uh, with the four guys has got us covered that's fine they've got our security handled i'm like they're only they're only monitoring to see if your stuff's online they're patching once in a while like that's it like yeah. there's nothing security related about that really folks you know? don't always understand that it's it's not always you being compromised somehow it could also just be you being used yeah. to compromise somebody somebody else, right? That, right. That's exactly right. Like that 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 is not that doesn't figure into most folks thinking. Uh, no, that's exactly right. What cybersecurity yeah. is, and yet, yet, you know, my friend, he, he sees this uh, as as he's doing his his day to day consulting. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about um, you know proper asset management you've done a deep sure. dive on it you've presented on it it's really interesting so you know first of all explain the terms like asset management in general what are we talking about we're talking about identifying what for a client like all mm -hmm. of their server switches routers the software that they're using and then also the 
Internet of Things devices, all those IoT devices. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about asset, mm -hmm. right, it it stands for any compute device. Right. And from an IT perspective, there's an understanding of what an asset is. But from a security perspective, there's a different understanding what that is. Of course, there's overlap, right? It's the same compute mm -hmm. device. But on the IT side, you'd be thinking about things like, what, what are the licenses associated with this? What is the right. replacement value of that device? Uh, how do I plan for capacity as I grow my company? Things like that. On the security side, you also care about like the hardware details, the software that's on it and things like this, but you also care about what are the security controls on that device? What are the vulnerabilities on that device? What are the insecure configurations on the device? Right. So there's a slightly different take no, maybe not even slightly, but there's a different take on, you know, what what is important. And that's what a cyber asset is. And cyber asset management is basically taking that inventory and one, having it maintained and up to date all the time. But two, allowing you to see all the security ramifications of that device and then either uh, proactively managing that or in the case of an incident where you're reacting to something to be very quick to be able to identify what that device is, what the vulnerabilities are, configurations are, who is who are the human beings that are associated with that device in order to reach a very fast resolution. So it's 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 quicker on the meantime to like detect and then also to to act. Yes, the well I, I just listened to this talk by Eric Olson about uh, metrics and security, and mm -hmm. I'm afraid to use the terms mean time to anything anymore. Oh, but yeah, uh, exactly yes, right. yeah, you, you do want to shorten the amount of time that it takes you to, to go from finding about out about something and then and then squashing it so it's no longer hurting your organization. Another part of asset inventory that's very important, especially from the security perspective, is the idea of seeing everything on your network. 20 years ago, it was pretty easy to to identify what you had. Yeah, it, it, was. it, it, it was it was easier anyway. Yeah, because everything was in the office. Right, and everything was a laptop or a server, or maybe a database. Yep. Like that was about it. I had a handful of printers, but a lot has changed in the last twenty years. Right, we have devices mm -hmm. in the cloud. Yep. We have devices that are no longer connected to your LAN because they're at your employees' homes. Right. You know, even before the pandemic, there was this whole work from home trend that was sort of accelerating. Yep. Uh, you have the idea the smart refrigerators. You right. have all of the 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 cameras. They just every aspect, and it's all tied in. Maybe the, it's the segmented, but devices. it's all still part of the network. Yeah, IoT devices are now everywhere. Like you have mm -hmm. you have a smart speaker at home. You have like house automation with the doorbell and, and things like this. And you know, the, another part of that on the OT side is the fact that there was a time when IT and OT were separate. Mm -hmm. OT, like your robot, your robotic arms, your medical devices, your water treatment uh, plants, and, and things like this. Your 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 oil pipeline. Those used to be completely separate from IT. In fact, they used to be air gapped. Mm -hmm. And then, right around like 2005 or so, there's been this convergence of IT and OT. And so you had this environment that used to rely on obscure uh, security through isolation that is no longer isolated right. and they have not had any of the innovation in terms of security that we've had on the, on, on the IT side, you know, no EDR, no anti malware, nothing like that. Uh, some, some have firewalls these days, but now you have all these, this entire environment that's now accessible over the internet. Right. And that is something that the security team now has to protect. So all of that goes into into uh, cyber asset management, just finding about everything that you have in your network, making sure it's accurate so that you can take action on it, either from on a proactive basis, if you're trying to close things down, uh, or uh, on a reactive basis, if you're in the midst of an incident, you have to go deal with something. So that is all part of cyber asset management. And it, it's rather comprehensive in terms of its scope. And it is certainly a very foundational tool that should be in every single security program, right? It's, it, if you look at CIS controls, that's control number one. 
Yeah, right it there. is. Like, it's the, the very the first, first one, one of the of the what are the yeah. new ones? Eighteen as opposed to what they used to be 20 yeah, or something. You don't, yeah. you don't get more foundational than this. Right. It is the first one. Yeah. That know, you know what and, you have plugged in, right? Yeah. And what, what's challenging here is that many people believe that their existing tools already provide a full asset inventory. So many folks believe that their EDR provides a full asset inventory. Many people believe that their Vuln scanner provides a full and accurate asset inventory. CMDB. Knack, um, or you know some other tools. Many folks believe that some of these incumbent tools that they have in their tech stack already do the job, and the fact of the matter is, they do not. Why is that? Because they are primarily optimized for managed IT devices. Mm -hmm. They are primarily managed for IT servers and PCs and laptops and things like that. Right, right. So think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say I have an EDR. Mm -hmm. That's software that I have to install on the mm -hmm. device. Yeah, there has to be if an I agent on the device. Yeah. Right. So if I can install something on that device, that means I know about right. it. I probably manage it. I probably probably already protect it as well. You know, same thing with a, a Vuln scanner or the discovery tool that goes with the CMDB. Like they tend to use authenticated active scanners. If I can log into a device, how is it that I, I don't know about it already? I, of course I know about it already. I probably manage it already. I probably are protected. It's the things that we don't know about, yeah. the unmanaged stuff that really gets you into trouble. And you know, it would be it would be wrong to think, oh well, uh, you know, I, I have ninety five percent coverage. Um, I, I have ninety percent coverage of of what I know, right? Because the adversary doesn't just attack the one device that manage the adversary will tend to do recon on your network first. Oh yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, almost and, always. and if they see, okay, these devices here are up to date on their patches. They have security controls. And that one over there is, looks like it's been sitting in the corner for 10 years and nobody's touched it. We're and, going after that one. Yeah, of course. Like why, yeah. why would they go after the hard thing when they could just go and attack that and then right. use that as a base as a for operating position to then like, you know, laterally move later and take their time to, to, to figure out what they can ransom or exfiltrate. So yeah. like it's those unmanaged devices that have an outsized impact on your ability to defend the organization. So um, to say that, oh, how I many business owners are even aware? I see to me, I think that they were business leaders, right? I think they, they hear the gigabit talk from their security teams, right? Sure. Or their MSP or their whatever, right? And, and they just assume, well, they know what they have. They know, they know we've, we've paid for the devices, Yeah. you know, and, and they don't even know that they're at the risk, the level of risk that maybe they're at. Yeah. You know, it's like in accounting, sometimes like, there are little, little charges mm -hmm. that like nobody really knows like where that came from or what it was for. And it just like, gets like put into a bucket of like, yeah. just, like write that off. It's just like that. There's, there's technical debt within organizations mm -hmm. the older you are um the more mergers and acquisitions you've had the more turnover and staff that you had you know not just like exiting the company but it's just like internal reworks the more likely you're going to have things mm -hmm. devices that have like fallen out of management and they're just sitting there right so that's uh, really interesting so let me back that up say mm -hmm. that again because i think that's a that's an interesting the older the organization, the more M and A that they've had, the more staff changes. More staff changes, and the also, more ad hoc adding of devices and stuff. Right. right? The the so, less the less security governance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you're more likely to have these unmanaged devices that are and the higher risk that you're at, and you don't might not even know that. Of course. Yeah. Because the adversary doesn't just attack one device; they tend to recon first to figure f find their targets. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if they're at a point where they're, you know, maybe in combination with phishing or they're past the phishing, uh, you know, infiltration point, you know, they're looking for things that are easy to go after uh, in order to expand their reach within your organization. And, you know, some organizations uh, have fewer unmanaged devices, some have more, but uh, I think it's a sure thing to say that every organization has some unmanaged device. 
somewhere. Oh, absolutely. And most don't know it. I mean, that's just, that's really the... By definition. By yeah. definition. Unmanaged device is an unknown yep. unknown on your network. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's so that's so interesting. And so that's where automation and zero trust could really benefit organizations. But again, that's going to benefit the larger organizations that are doing business with the federal government compared to the SMB space, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because the SMB space, zero trust is like, what, yeah, I, I need to produce things like I, I i i need everybody to have because it's more horizontal like those organizations are more horizontal various people will have multiple roles and need access to a lot of different things quickly mm -hmm. as opposed to a hierarchical larger organization where you can limit things because that's a very specific role that somebody has yeah and certainly i would say that asset inventory is a key foundational component to zero trust as well right because mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems with zero trust is when you try to enforce you end up kicking off people kicking people off the network that you weren't supposed to they had a legitimate reason to be on the network but you just didn't know about it or mm -hmm. a device that was critical to your organization you just didn't know about it but as you as you flipped on the switch for zero trust enforcement then boom like all of a sudden now you're having an outage so having that asset inventory is is a very key component to zero trust uh you need it in order to have to ensure success in your in your zero trust initiatives i would say how would let me ask you this how would zero trust work in an smb space like how did they how do they implement that 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 is a very tough question i don't know if we're going to be able to answer that one in in the short amount of time i yeah. I do wish that from industry there were some zero trust light for SMB. Yeah, and something, something that's like more clear. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because it's not a product. It's not a system. It's no. like a. It's a. It's a journey. Right. Like it is a journey. It was. It was technically a term that was invented by a research professor, I think, in the UK a while ago. And wasn't it's also, Forrester Forrester research involved in a lot of that too, or no? No, I, I, I'm pretty sure somebody at a university. I forget his name now, hmm. but you know, it's also become a marketing buzzword, and so yeah, you see it everywhere. Conflation of of things that zero trust is not really. Um, yeah, it's it like is. AI. It's like AI. Yeah, right. Yeah. You're like everything that was doing the same thing. You're like, oh, this is AI now. It's like really because it was automated. It's AI all of a sudden. Yeah. And zero trust as a concept is a really, really good idea. Oh yeah. Implementing it's hard and teasing out like what it means and how you get it done from all that marketing fluff is, is, yeah. is a huge challenge as well. So maybe yeah. that's the first step is to, to somehow separate zero trust, the marketing and, and zero trust, like a solution, a solution. Right. Or, yeah. And, and, and create a model for like SMBs, almost like a set of controls. Yeah. Cause you know, zero trust has different ramifications depending on what part of cybersecurity you're looking at. Are you looking at authentication? Right. Are you looking at devices? Exactly. Are you looking at the network? Like, right. Exactly. And SMBs don't, they don't get into that finite detail. They don't have the capacity or they don't have the resources to be doing that. Am I secure now? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly, am I, you, you got me? You're my guy. We good? Yeah. Yep. Like you're good. Small business you, you owners can, I, you can I talk sleep to. At night. Like that's yeah. what it is. Like, I know. You know I, I remember speaking to one, she said, Oh, I hired this person and I'm secure now. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, oh yeah, like, okay, yeah. We, well, I, I hired a kid who like graduated with a, with a security degree. We're, we're secure now. Nothing has changed in the environment. Like, no, nothing yeah. is. There's nothing done, but we we hired the guy. So yeah. I'm like, okay. So oh there's still a mean, long ways to go. It's the first step, but it's a long way to, to yeah, secure more education for yeah society at large i would say yeah that's great so what's coming up next for you as we wrap up tell us thank thank you for your time it's been fantastic i could talk to you for hours yeah yeah i'd love to come again so yeah, I'll, i would I'll, love to have you again for sure i'll i'll be at summer camp in august so black hat mm -hmm. oh i have a talk at b size las vegas oh uh, fantastic when's that uh, that is august 8th or 9th okay right? Uh, and I'll be doing more more uh, in-person talks going forward. I'll be at Blue Team Con and um, 
uh, Texas Cyber Summit, GERCON, and, and things like this. But yeah, I'll, I'll be at I'll be in Las Vegas for summer camp. So so Black Hat, DefCon, uh, will be there. Awesome. Well, yeah. uh, we'll have a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah. Circle back with us after that, and we will definitely talk again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and b New York City is going to happen next year um, as well. Awesome. So that's, that's, okay, that, good. The planning for that is like year long. So we're Yep, and we'll grab the links. We'll put links in the show notes. So everybody connect with Huxley on LinkedIn. Follow him. You can Google him. He's all over the place. Lots, lots of great information. Really good insight. Uh, the industry needs you. So thank you so much for your time today, buddy. Thank you for having me, David. Appreciate all right, man. Talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps this up. Thanks for joining everybody. Hope you got value out of digging deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Please don't forget to help keep this going by subscribing free to our YouTube channel at Cybercrime Junkies Podcast and download and enjoy all of our past episodes on Apple and Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and we thank you for joining us.